Well, you can be seated. If you're at home joining us online, I imagine you're probably already seated. But can I, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Happy Time Change Sunday. Yeah, it's a 930 service, but morning people are here right now, right? The morning people, uh, we lost an hour, we spring forward. But the good news was, is we also chose today to do two services. Uh, we're trying to get back into some some things we used to do before COVID. So we're going to have a 930 in person, 11 o'clock in person. So some of those people can sleep in who come. And some of you are online, you'll still say it the same way. You'll just sleep in and watch the 11 o'clock service online. But because we knew today would be hard, we also opened up our coffee shop today and free coffee. Listen, there are a few things in life that, that make me as happy as the words free coffee. Um, words like, from my wife, I love you. Words from an announcer on TV, the Browns win, and then followed up by free coffee. Those are good things. So if you haven't got your free coffee, I encourage you to stop out when we're done today and um, grab a cup, hang out a little bit outside and those sort of things and just get a chance to mingle a little bit. But I am glad that you have chosen to join us, whether it's here, whether it's online. And if you've been a part of us for any time now, you know we're in the midst of this series where we've been looking at the book of Mark. And every week we've been opening up, whether it's myself, Pastor Chris, or Pastor Mike, or other teaching pastors, and looking into the book of Mark. And, and when I'm teaching, there's specifically some questions that I'm asking us to grapple with. Three of them specifically. Here's the first one. What did Jesus do? The second one, well, what does that mean to us, and how does it apply to us? And the third one is, if it applies to us, we need to look at our life and ask this question. Is there anything we need to do to change? Right? Right? And the reason that we're in the book of Mark, and the reason that as we get into each text each week that we're asking ourselves this question, is this reality. That as we look into Scripture, Scripture makes it very, very clear that it's not enough if we profess to be Christians, followers of Jesus Christ. It, it's not enough just to like Jesus, but rather the call of God in our life is to be like Jesus. Jesus. What does that mean? That means that it's not enough just to, to say words about Jesus. It, it, it's not enough to, to get on your Instagram or your Facebook or whatever that you're on and, and maybe post a nice picture like I did this morning of my Bible out with some coffee. Letting people know that, that you believe in Jesus. It, it's not enough to to talk to someone or, or get on Instagram or Facebook and to say something that is defending Jesus. Some of you are still brave enough out here to have one of those fish on the back of your car. At, at one point, some of you thought that was a good idea. Maybe to keep you accountable when you're driving. But I want you to know, it, it's not enough to have a fish on the back of your car. It's not even enough, I want you to catch this, to know a lot about who Jesus is what he said, and what he's asking us to do. But the call of Jesus in our life isn't just to know about him, but rather to live and do and act in the way that he calls us to do. And, and that, if we're just honest, can sometimes be challenging. And it'll be challenging this morning as we find ourselves in the book of Mark. We'll be in chapter 9 this morning, so you can just head there with your Bibles now if you want, or however you get there on your phone or your tablet or online, you can just click on the link. But Mark chapter 9 is sort of jam-packed with all types of things. It starts with Jesus taking Peter, James, and John, three of the 12 disciples, up to the top of this mountain. And up there, he has this interaction with Elijah and Moses. We call it the Mount of Transfiguration. It's this great moment. And then Jesus and the three disciples come down the mountain, and they discover the other nine disciples are there. And they're struggling, those nine disciples, with, with doing something that they had been able to do before. And so as we talked last week, there's this whole discussion around what makes our faith actually effective in our life. Because if we're going to be like Jesus, we need to have an effective faith. But then as we get to verse 30 or so in Mark chapter 9, what we see is that that scene about effective faith is over. And Jesus starts walking from Galilee to Capernaum. And as he's walking, he begins to tell his disciples about this reality that he is going to sacrifice himself. He is going to die. And all of these things, I think, in Mark chapter 9 that we read kind of come together at this moment to catalyze this sort of interesting conversation that's going to occur. 
You know, in life, sometimes there are a whole lot of things can happen that start to bring something or start bringing us into this conversation that we want to have. And I don't know if you've noticed, many times when we have conversations, people develop opinions. I mean, can you think of anything that's happened over the last year that would have catalyzed conversation and made people develop an opinion? Anything? Ah, there's probably a whole lot, right? And, and what I've noticed is, is that many times as we engage these interesting conversations, and they're catalyzed by the moments around us, that for some people it's not that their desire around what they're saying or what they might even be doing is a bad desire. The struggle is, is they, they begin to go about engaging it in the wrong way. Here's what I mean by that. Because what happens in our life if we have the right desire, but we're going about it the wrong way? What happens in our life if we have a right desire around a subject, a, a situation, or whatever it may be, but we go about tackling or, or dealing with that subject in the wrong way? What occurs then? I would like to submit that when that occurs, there, there's going to be some problems. Um, Sometime back, I shared this story, but I think it bears repeating. It wasn't long into the COVID sort of shutdown pandemic, and my wife and I found ourselves at home watching television like a lot of us do in this moment, and we turned the dishwasher on. Now, confession, we don't do this anymore, but any of you actually ever turn the dishwasher on and then leave the house, some of you? Yeah, yeah. I, I used to constantly do that up until this moment. So what's happening in this moment is, is I was uh, sitting on the couch. My wife was sitting on the couch. And as we're sitting on the couch together, we're watching whatever it is we're watching. But out of the left side of my ear, I can hear the dishwasher running. And then, and then all of a sudden I hear this. <laughs> Look, I'm no plumber, but that's not a good sound. And so I get up and I, and I rush to under the sink and I start pulling all the... If you, have you ever noticed how much stuff is under your sink when you actually got to get to something under your sink that matters? I'm throwing bleach and trash cans and stuff everywhere. And I noticed that the supply line that goes to the dishwasher had exploded. So all of a sudden the, the water's exploded and that sort of stuff is going everywhere. So I reach over to turn off the supply valve. It's right there, right? Some of you people know what I'm talking about. You turn it. It's supposed to turn everything off. Only problem is, I don't believe that valve had ever been turned since the house had been built. So I turned it and it didn't work. So we got more water coming out. So I do my basic plumbing stuff and I, I run downstairs because I knew where the water shutoff valve for the whole house was. Boom, I shut the water off. I go upstairs thinking, hey, the water should stop going everywhere. But it doesn't. It's only later to a more well-intentioned, well-informed person who knew something about plumbing said this to me. Brian, yes, you turned off the water to the house, but there's still water in all the pipes. And what you needed to do was to go to the basement where we have a bathroom and turn on all the water to those and force that water to there to move it away from the kitchen sink to get it all out. You see, I didn't know that. And so I sat there with a bucket and trying to catch it all and doing all that sort of stuff. And as a result, not only now do I have a new supply line, a new faucet, I also have some damage i got to fix in the basement ceiling. I bring that up because I think every one of us would agree that, that I had a right desire to stop the water. The problem wasn't my desire. The problem was the way that I was going about it. And I think there are times in our life where this isn't just a physical illustration, but there's also a spiritual one in our life that, that we have right desires, but how we go about it is, is somewhat confusing or we, we mess it up a little bit. And there's probably no greater example than the subject that Jesus is going to broach here in Mark chapter 9. Because in Mark chapter 9, Jesus is going to talk about something that I don't think we talk about a lot in church. And one of the reasons I think we don't talk about it a lot is because we bring up this topic and we don't know how to talk about the topic that most all of us desire to have in our life because most of the time we've seen it done in the wrong way. And it's this topic of greatness. So I'm like, hold on a second. We're going to talk about in church, like this gathering of people that I'm allowed to desire to be great. Yeah, absolutely. But what we're going to talk about here is that Jesus is going to draw to the point that many times we have this right desire in our life, but we go about it the wrong way. We try to accomplish greatness in the wrong way. And I want to tell you this. If we try to accomplish 
What Jesus is going to be talking about here in Mark chapter 9 about this idea of greatness in the wrong way, I can guarantee you this. There's no possible way we will ever wind up being like Jesus. We might like Jesus. We might be able to talk about Jesus. We may be able to post on social media about Jesus. We may still have the fish on the back of our car. And we still may know a lot of things in our head about Jesus. But we won't be like Jesus. And so if you're there, Mark chapter 9. We're going to pick up in verse 33. Because again, as they're on their way to the Capernaum, now Jesus and the disciples, they've just left this moment. He talked about their faith. He talked about the fact now that he is going to die. And he begins to engage them as he now arrives at where they're arriving in verse 33. Verse 33, Jesus and his disciples get to Capernaum. And it says this in the latter half of verse 33. And when he, Jesus, was in the house, he, Jesus, asked them, What were you discussing On the way. But they kept silent. For on the way, they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. All right, so you got to catch this. They've had all these moments, and now they're walking. And and Jesus, as he's walking and he's talking with them, he's talking about this idea and this reality that he's going to die and sacrifice himself. And I don't know exactly how it works out there, but he keeps walking and it engages and catalyzes his conversation with the disciples behind about this idea of who's going to be the greatest. And so now when he gets to the house, Jesus asks him a question. And we need to see this question as it is. This is not a question that Jesus is asking out of ignorance. This is a question that Jesus is asking to open up an opportunity to learn, to be discipled, to teach a little bit. I was thinking about this this week, and um, I don't know if your parents were like this, or maybe one of your parents was like this, or you had someone in your life. But my mom, yeah, some of your moms like eyes on the back of your head. I'm convinced that the vast majority of questions she asked me in my life were rhetorical. Especially the ones where she asked this, what were you doing? You, you know some of your moms what I'm talking about? You're asking the question, but you already know the answer. You're like, what were you doing? You know, there could have been a list of things when I was a teenager I was doing. All of them were most likely not intelligent, at least when I was a teenager. And so she'd ask me, and she sort of engaged this. Jesus kind of does the same thing. In fact, he does a lot like the same thing. And I don't want you to know this, that Jesus already knows what they've been talking about. We don't know for sure why he knows. Maybe he's just got really good hearing, and he was up ahead, and he heard them talking about it. We also know over and over the example in the book of Mark is is that that Jesus, in giving us an example of how to live in our humanity, listens over and over to the Holy Spirit, to what the Holy Spirit's saying. And maybe the Holy Spirit informed him. He said, hey, this is what they're talking about. But this is what I love about Jesus here. What I love about Jesus is he knows exactly what they're talking about, that he had just talked about he was going to die, and their next conversation is great. Who gets to be the greatest? Instead of scolding them, instead of being angry at the madam, he invites them into a conversation. Let me just say that I believe most of us, especially me, would fail to be just like Jesus in this moment. Right? I wouldn't invite if I knew that was happening. I would be ready to fight if I knew that was happening. Maybe you think that's not how you would be. Okay, so let's just kind of walk that out a little bit. Imagine, and I don't think it would take much for us to imagine because all of us kind of probably know of someone or know someone personally, or maybe it's even been us, that COVID has impacted their life. Now imagine you've worked your your whole life for this job, and you've got the best job you've ever wanted. You're the happiest you've ever been. It's a perfect place. You're making a, a great living. You're providing for all the things you need to provide for. But now, boom, COVID happens. And whether it's you or someone around you, something happens with COVID, and it requires you basically to leave this job you've always wanted. There's nothing you can do about it. You've got to leave. And so you have a meeting with your team or whatever it may be, whether it's over Zoom or in person, socially distant, I don't know. Just We're all imagining this, right? And you tell them, hey, because of what's happened in COVID, I've got to quit my job and I'm leaving you. And then you leave the meeting or you sign off from your screen. And then you find out as soon as you signed off, As soon as you left that meeting, the next conversation that everyone had is, who gets his corner office? Who gets his position? Who gets his... 
How do you think that would make you feel? I don't think most of us would be willing to invite into a conversation of discipleship in that moment. We'd want to fight. Like, come on. How can you be so insensitive? How can you be so jerkish in the midst of all of this? And, and when we look at the disciples, there's a lot of this insensitivity that's happening around them. But also, a lot of this insensitivity that happened around them was due to the fact that they had begun to baptize themselves, so to speak, and how the culture around them worked in that day. In ancient life, social rank and where you fit in social rank deeply mattered. I mean, I think we think in, in Northern Virginia what's on our business card or where our office is or how much uh, money we have in our bank account or our type of house or car or whatever it is that we want to use to, to rank ourselves socially. We think that's a big deal. It, it is, but it was nothing like the ancient life. Like in the ancient life, it affected everything. And for Jewish people, number one, they were already a little bit lower because they were under Roman rule. So by nature, they're a little farther down in the social rank because they had been conquered. But even more so, most all of the disciples came from a way of living in a background. Would they be even farther down the Jewish uh, social status rank? The, the disciples, many of them were fishermen. That wasn't high. Certainly we talked about Matthew slash Levi before. He was a tax collector. He was way on the bottom. And for, for people in that way of living, especially for people in the Jewish background and the culture, they... They began to think about this idea and hope for that at some point they would have a new, better status in the world to come. And so the disciples, right, they have found themselves called by God in the flesh, Jesus, to come around and be them. And they know they're going to be with him. And they know, whether they grasp it all or not, what's going to happen, that he's going to die. And all of a sudden they're like, oh, I'm going to get upgraded in my status someday. And they start thinking through this idea of greatness through the cultural lens of their moment. And, and in that moment, what happens is, is it exhibits this idea that they have a right desire around greatness, but they have a completely wrong way of thinking about it. I mean, and Jesus knows this. Jesus clearly knows they're misguided in, in this sort of corner office mentality of life. And so he says, hey, what were you guys talking about? Isn't it amazing how quiet they got all of a sudden? You remember when we've been buffeted? Like, someone asked a probing question, like, what were you doing? What were you thinking? Whatever it might be. And upon asking of the question, immediately self-reflection hits, and you think to yourself, huh, probably shouldn't have been talking about that. Or maybe that wasn't the most emotionally intelligent thing to discuss at this moment. This is what happens. And, and in this moment, when he asks them, they get super quiet. And, and the best way you can describe it is they have this sort of wordless confession in this moment. Huh, shouldn't have been doing this. Now, it could have stopped right there. Because I think all of us have had moments where people have asked questions. And the only design of asking that question was to point out where we've made a mistake. Jesus could have paused right there and said, hey, boom, you've made a mistake and just let it go. But Jesus doesn't do that. Take a look at what he does now. Verse 35. And he sat down and he called the twelve. So here's Jesus, right? He, he takes a seat. He calls them around and he says this. If anyone would be first... He must be last of all and servant of all. Verse 36 says this, And he took a child and put him in the midst of them, and, and taking him in his arms, the child, he said to them, Jesus now says to his disciples, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. That's some good stuff here if you don't recognize it. Jesus automatically does something that's different uh, for them and their culture, it is for us, right? In, in our culture, many times we project authority or position by standing high. Believe it or not, when we created this building and we designed it, one of the things we wanted to do is I, I wanted this thing, this platform that I stand on to be as low as humanly possible so you could still see. But also the higher it is, the more it implies I'm the authority. By the way, I'm not. He is. His word is. I'm just here to let you know what it says. Okay? In that culture, though, it's so different. If you want to take the position of authority, you sat down. I don't know how Jesus was sitting down. I don't know if he's like, you know, crisscross applesauce, whatever it might be. He was, he was down, and, you know, and he invites the disciples around him. And he begins to, like, 
talk to them about this idea and redefining greatness, not as a superior position, but a serving lifestyle. He's like, the position, the thought, the idea of greatness is different than you think. Jesus says to them, if you want to be first, you should be last. And this is a radical thing to say because for them, a lot of them in their mind, they're like, I'm already last on the social order. How am I first if you're saying this? And it's because, again, they're thinking about it through this idea of rank. They had the wrong idea of what it meant to be great. And it needed changing. Somehow, some way, what they began to think about and, and, and to process in their mind, that greatness was about position. It's about if we, if we have the corner office, if we have this particular thing, life would be great. And I don't think that they woke up one morning and decided, hey, I want to think that way. I think that very easily in their culture, it began to infiltrate into their life. And they allowed culture then to dictate this idea of greatness more so than God. Anybody relate to that? I mean, how easy is it for us in our life? We get to think about this idea of greatness. I mean, in fact, if I told you I was preaching a sermon on greatness, many of us would go, whoa, you can't do that. Because by definition, we begin to think about greatness through this concept of, of, of power and authority and corner offices and what's on our business card. And it's not just individuals, by the way, too. It can happen with churches. You know, we pray that as God has put us in this community, you've heard me say this over and over again, that our vision is to be indispensable to the community around us within five years. Because we believe if we're able to do that and we can serve in that way, that is what will make this gathering of people great. You know, it's really easy, even in church world, to begin to define greatness by things that God doesn't define greatness by. We have a really, really nice building. That means actually zero about greatness. You know, we could have 12 people or 12,000 people coming in person or joining us online. And you know, that actually means zero about greatness. Now, there are great places that have 12,000 people, but don't just assume because they have 12,000 people, they're great. See the little way it sneaks into our life? Greatness isn't about the things that we often begin to think that it is. And we can fall in this temptation. True greatness, Jesus is talking about here, arise from this attitude that results in us serving. One of those three weeks that we had to take off from gathering in person because of the weather. And by the way, wasn't that weird? Like three Sundays in a row. If it wouldn't have been for COVID, that would have been the weirdest thing I'd ever experienced as a pastor. <laughs> COVID's like, you know, hold my Coke. It's no big deal, right? But one of those, I, I, I took a moment and went away from the series in Mark to talk about why in the calling again of being like Jesus. And we look to Philippians chapter 2. And Philippians chapter 2 says, let this mind, let this way of living be in you that is in Christ Jesus. Who humbled himself, who took upon the form of a servant. So let me, let me summarize this. Be like Jesus and serve. And, and this is kind of the same sort of thing that Jesus is illustrating here. When he talks about this idea here in Mark chapter 9, looking at verse 35 to 37, when he's talking about servant. And he does it really amazingly by, by using this idea of, of a child. I, I know that we know this, that Jesus was a master teacher. He was brilliant. But, man, he just had the ability to drive so many points home with one thing. I don't know if we think about this or not. And this isn't just to sound smart or any of that sort of stuff. But most of us don't recognize that um, the Bible, the Old Testament's Hebrew in general, the New Testament's Greek, but they spoke Aramaic in the New Testament. And so it's highly likely that when Jesus is speaking here, Jesus is speaking Aramaic to his disciples. You say, why does that matter? Here's why it matters. Because the word child in Aramaic is the same word as the word servant. And they would have known that. So he's doing this sort of double-edged thing here, or two sides of the coin, however you want to say it. He's like, you need to be like a child. And you think about a child at a certain age. Yes, they have some selfish tendencies and those sort of things. But they're givers. I mean, they, they just love and they care and they serve. He's like, have that attitude like a child. But also, the other part of it, when he says to serve that child, when you're serving the child, a servant like me, meant something significant that maybe we don't grasp. A child at that time was only valued, right, for his or her potential. A child yet couldn't work 
Couldn't provide for the family. Couldn't do that. So there was potential value in having a child. But not until that child could do something where they considered actually valuable. That, by the way, is one of the reasons why the lowest people in the social rank, slaves, were often give children to watch. And once that child got value by being able to contribute to society, to be able to perform, and that's a sermon for a whole other time, that we believe our value comes from our performance and what we produce. Then, then, it mattered. But when Jesus is saying this, he's saying serve them. He's saying, listen, when you're, when you're taking care of a child, when you're being like a child and serving, when you're serving someone who could give nothing back to you, what you're doing is you're actually serving me. And this is a profound way of Jesus redefining greatness to the disciples. It wasn't greatness by the disciples' definition. It wasn't greatness by the culture's definition. It was greatness by Jesus' definition. If there's anyone who should be able to define greatness for us, it should be Jesus, right? Because he's the one that created us. He's the one that created this world. He's the one that holds it all together. Jesus is not against this. This idea of greatness. What he is trying to bring to the idea in our minds is that too often what happens is we have the right desires, but we're going about it the wrong way. And so he's saying, look, if you want to be great, this is how it works. This, this is what he models, which brings us this, how does this apply to us? I mean, how, how in our lives do we need to look at this section of Scripture and say, wow, this is really trying to communicate something to me that, that I might need to change. The first is this. Is that true greatness, as Jesus is making clear, is not about superiority, but it's about sacrifice. And we need to wrestle with that. Because I think it's really easy to nod to that, but really hard to do. Because without even trying too many times, we've allowed the definitions of culture in the world around us to define how we should live, especially with this concept of greatness. And it's very difficult for us sometimes to say, wow, if, if I'm going to be great... I need to be willing to put myself last to be first. And we go, I don't know if I can do that. Why? Because what Jesus is saying is paradoxical to how we experience our lives most of the time in the world around us. But just because it's a paradox doesn't mean it's not true. Jesus is saying, look, true greatness, it's not about superiority. And so what happens is when we don't understand how he's defining it, what we wind up doing is we wind up turning off the supply valve because we know a little bit about plumbing or we wind up going downstairs and shutting off the main valve to the house because we know a little bit about water and how it flows. But we still don't get it completely and we wind up having some damage in our spiritual life and in the lives of others. And in that moment, it's not about not having the right desire. It's about going about it the wrong way. Jesus is saying, look, this is not about superiority. This is about sacrifice, which brings us to the second thing. True greatness cannot be achieved without action. I want to just, let's breathe this for a moment, okay? Can we just admit there's this temptation to... To come in on a, a Sunday or to watch online right now or some point during the week and to hear Jesus say something through scripture and nod and go, whew, that's some good stuff. And then not do a thing about it. I had a pastoral friend who was a lot more bold than I am. So I can tell the story about him. I've never done it, but I, I, I'm going to kind of guess say it right now. He had a small group of people that was actually going through the book of Mark. And they went through it verse by verse, line by line, and then they decided to go out and actually do what Mark had asked them to do. And about after three or four months of attempting to do what Mark was doing, one of the group members came back and said, Hey, Pastor, can we go back to our Bible study again and pick up another gospel or something? Because I really liked it when we did that. He said, I'll cut you a deal. We'll go to the book of Luke when we start actually living with the book of Mark taught us. What was his point? His point is, is that it's not enough just to know something in her head. Listen, one of the revelations, and I've shared this about our church and many churches. We're not the only one, but our church. When we did the reveal study was this. Is that we don't struggle as a group of people in believing about something that's true. That is not our struggle. We will amen it. We will thumbs up it. We will do all that. This is what Jesus calls us to do. Our struggle is then in actually doing it. I had a friend of mine that, that called it this way. We're really attracted to the bobblehead idea of Christianity. See the bobblehead, right? Really big head? Really small feet. Really big head. Look, look, genuine greatness is not perceived as this idea of just saying, listen, I know all of this. 
Listen, you can gain all the knowledge in the world about Jesus, but if you're not actually serving and living it out, you are missing something. And so we as a church have been trying to tackle this. A lot of this series is based around this idea of tackling that reality in our lives. And, and, and I know I'm not the only one that struggles with this, right? So we're doing some practical things right now. You say, hey, listen, Brian, this sounds great. You're right. I need to be more like Jesus. I need to serve. But I don't know how I, I should serve. I don't know my giftings. It's great. We've developed this class called Square One where um, – Number one, it tells you what we believe. Number two, it understands how God has made you. And number three, it empowers you to go out and serve, either locally or in the community. Our next one starts on April the 11th. That's the Sunday uh, after Easter. Sign up if you don't know. It doesn't matter whether you've been to this church this full 44 years of existence or whether you've been here for 44 months or 44 days. We can all learn in that moment. We can do that. Maybe, maybe you already know your giftings and that sort of stuff. You're just looking for a place. We made this available for everyone coming in this morning. Ways and places you can serve. Right? Because I think sometimes we struggle in just saying, okay, I'm willing to do it, but I need someone to give me a little bit of direction. So we want to help you, give you some direction. Because we're to call to be like Jesus. Not just to know a lot about Jesus. Not just to slap a fish sticker on the back of our car. Not just to post something on social media, but actually to live and to breathe and act. And Jesus is saying, listen, greatness cannot be accomplished without this idea of serving. And so take it, fill out the information, drop it off out at the gathering place, or rather the welcome center out there uh, where people gather, and we'll get back to you. We'll help you connect, either it's here or in the local community, because greatness cannot be achieved without action. Here's the third thing. True greatness also is absent of expectation. So if we find ourselves going, okay, Brian, I hear what Scripture says. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start serving because my hope is that when I serve, I'm going to get something back. I mean, it's not really serving, right, if we help that neighbor across the street with mowing their lawn because we hope that then when the snow comes, they'll use their snowblower in our driveway. Is it? Is that what he's talking about here? I think that's why the power of the child is so big here. When you use that example, he's letting us know that true greatness is about caring for people without expectation of earthly reward. And that also means many, many times caring for people who we know have no ability at all to give back. Listen, COVID has changed a ton about how we function and live and work. And those people who are part of our church know that we had this whole initiative moving into this new community that we're in called the Reimagine Initiative. And we laid out all kinds of things. And there's some things that we had to change simply because COVID forced us to change them. But there are two things that did not change no matter what. We said our commitment to widows, orphans, and the poor. See, that's two or three working on the math we're still doing that at the same level we committed to why because we know that we're called to serve especially those who are in a situation that they can't serve for themselves and you say well i don't know a lot of widows but let me say this there, there may not be a lot of widows that you know there's a lot of functional widows that you know people who are in a divorce situation and they have a former spouse that's not helping or not doing anything that sort of it's the same life for them they're struggling with we are called to help and to serve. True greatness isn't we're called to help them and serve. And so if, if you hear me saying this right now and saying, oh, the reason why we're doing it is so Brian can stand up and do a sermon and say, we're doing this, you're missing the point. That's not what I'm trying to do. True greatness is absent of expectation. Here's the last thing. True greatness serves Jesus as we serve others. There's this section in Matthew chapter 25 that just blows people's mind. When Jesus says, hey, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was cold, you clothed me. Um, when I was thirsty, you gave me water. And they're looking around when Jesus is saying, they're like, what do you mean, God? I, I did this for you. He's like, well, when you did it for the least of these. Here's the point. When you go and you live and you're being like Jesus in whatever way he's called you to be for others, you're actually doing it for Jesus. And by the way. That's really the key in no expectation. Because when we can serve Jesus, we've already gotten everything from him we ever need. That's the truth of the gospel. You see, as we dig into Mark chapter 9, he's, he's beginning to redefine some things. And Jesus is, is telling us, listen, this, greatness isn't the problem. Too often in life, it's our definition of greatness that's the problem. We need to take what he's saying and apply it to our lives. That it's not about superiority but it's about sacrifice. It, it can be achieved 
only through action. We have to have no expectations. And when we're doing, we're serving Jesus, which brings us to the last question. What do we need to change? Because, again, if we, if we sit in here today and we, we watch online and we hear all of this and we say, yeah, that sounds really good, but we then apply it to our life and don't let it change anything that needs to be changed. It, it accomplishes nothing. H- have you in this moment and find yourself having right desires to be great but realize you've been going about it the wrong way? I, I might suggest that in the world that we live in, it's highly probable that a lot of us have been going out it the wrong way. Can I invite you to engage this section of Scripture, hear from God, and, and to step out and start asking God's help to change and act and, and to begin serving, whether it's your neighbor or it's a family member or someone here locally in this body or out. There are so many ways. You say, well, well, hold on a second. I can't do this yet. I haven't got all my junk figured out. I can't serve until I'm perfect. I can't serve. Have you ever said this? I can't serve because I'm not fully ready yet. I'd like to submit that Matthew slash Levi, the tax collector, wasn't fully ready when Jesus called him to serve. Peter, James, and John, not fully ready. Thomas, not fully ready. Go through any of the disciples, not fully ready. There's no such thing as ready. There's only listening to God, obeying a God, and he equips us along the way. And then as we go on this journey together, And we have this definition in our mind. He provides to help us be just like Jesus. God, may we now take these words, not just hear them, but apply them in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Whether you feel comfortable right now sitting down, you're at home watching, saying sit down, or whether in this room you want to stand, that's fine. But I want you to take these moments to to sing or reflect or maybe grab one of these and fill it out now. Either way, it's fine. But don't miss this moment and how God is calling you to act and to live.